Well, our reading today uh, is from Genesis chapter 17. Uh, You can follow along on the screen. You might have printed it out or in your own Bibles at home. Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him saying, I am God Almighty. Live in my presence and be devout. I'll establish my covenant between me and you and I will multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell to the ground and God spoke with him. As for me, my covenant is with you and you'll become the father of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram, but your name will be Abraham, for I'll make you the father of many nations. I'll make you extremely fruitful and will make nations and kings come from you. I'll keep my covenant between me and you, your offspring after you throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant to be your God and the God of your offspring after you. And to you and your offspring after you, I'll give the land where you are residing, all the land of Canaan, as an eternal possession, and I will be their God. God also said to Abraham, As for you, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations are to keep my covenant. This is my covenant which you are to keep between me and you and between me and you and your offspring after you. Every one of your males must be circumcised. You must circumcise the flesh of your foreskin to serve as a sign of the covenant between me and you. Throughout your generations, every male among you at eight days old is to be circumcised. This includes a slave born in your house, one purchased with money from any foreigner, the one who is not your offspring, a slave born in your house, as well as one purchased with money, must be circumcised. My covenant will be in your flesh as an everlasting covenant. If any male is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that man will be cut off from his people. He's broken my covenant. God said to Abraham, As for your wife Sarah, I do not call her Sarah, for Sarah will be her name. I'll bless her. Indeed, I'll give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she will produce nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell to the ground, laughed and thought in his heart, Can a child be born to a hundred-year-old man? Can Sarah, a 90-year-old woman, give birth? So Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael could live in your presence. But God said, No, your wife Sarah will bear you a son. You'll name him Isaac. I'll confirm my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I've heard you. I'll certainly bless him. I'll make him fruitful and will multiply him greatly. He'll father 12 tribal leaders and I'll make him into a great nation. But I'll confirm my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. When he finished talking with him, God withdrew from Abraham. Then Abraham took his son Ishmael and all the slaves born in his household purchased with his money, every male among the members of Abraham's household, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskin. On that very day, just as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when the flesh of his foreskin was circumcised and his son Ishmael was 13 years old when the flesh of his foreskin was circumcised. On that same day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised and all the men of his household, both slaves born in his house and those purchased with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a sermon outline there uh, in on the screen or on your service sheets. Please take notes. And if you have any questions, please use the comments box at the bottom of the page uh, to email any questions, comments, queries you might have to Neil or myself. All Christians, all of God's people really, live with two realities. And there's the reality of their true identity. A Christian is a sinner saved by God's merciful grace in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ alone. A Christian is someone who lives facing forward, looking forward to the promise of God that he'll return to judge the earth, set things right and take his people to live with him. And then there's the reality of the true and real world that Christians live in, a world broken by human sin a world in which we experience the heartache of that brokenness, a world where we grow old and our bodies and minds fail us, something I know all too well at the moment, a world where the promises of God seem to do nothing else but gather celestial dust. 
And Christians live between those two realities. And that kind of life wedged between those two realities raises some personal and searching questions. At times, where is God? How can I be sure that God will do as he has promised? How can I deal with life day to day as someone waiting for the promises of God to be fulfilled? And today's passage deals with some of those questions and the faithfulness of God. Let me pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. Thanks that we can read it. Uh, it's such this world that Abram and Sarah uh, existed in. Uh, it seems so different to our world. And yet as we dig into this passage, we'll see that you are the same God and humanity is the same and the solution is the same. Father, please open our eyes and ears and hearts and minds to these truths revealed in your word alone. Amen. I'm at point two on the outline over a number of sermons last year, this year, and perhaps years to come. We're working our way through the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. And Genesis 1 to 3, we see the world as God's made it, uh, the world as it broke, and the reason for why the world is as it is. Uh, God made the world perfect, in line with his design, with male and female, both in his image, to rule the world as his rulers, obeying his word, his people in his place, under his rule and blessing by his word. Uh, this was broken uh, by human sin, the attitude and action that says, uh, I am God and God is not, and God judged that rebellion just as he said, and his judgment is death for humans, and the world bears the brunt of this brokenness. In Genesis 4-11, to we see this effect on the world as human sin, and God judges them, and each time as God judges them, uh, there is his mercy, his undeserved mercy, his grace side by side. In Genesis 12 to 16, we see the plan laid by God to restore the world to his design and purpose. This involved God choosing one man, Abram, through whom he would restore the world, God's people living in God's place under God's rule and blessing by God's word. God made a covenant with Abram, Genesis 15, a binding agreement involving promises and obligations which he bore the weight of himself. This was described so clearly there and through Abram, God was going to restore the world, roll back sin and bring his blessing. The plan of God is based on grace, God's undeserved mercy to human beings who deserve his judgment. God's plan is received by taking him at his word, trusting him as Abram did in Genesis 15. And This trusting God and his promise restores people the right relationship with God as we saw in Genesis 15 verse 6. And as we've looked at Abram this year, he was, he is remarkably like us, isn't he? He heard the promise of God. He trusted God. He's declared righteous with God. But time and time again, he takes matters into his own hands, doesn't he? We saw that last week in Genesis 16. He does not trust the goodness of God, the ability of God to do as he says. So by Genesis 16, Abram's impatience well perhaps his wife Sarai's impatience and Abram fed into that with the plans of God have led him to father a son by a slave girl in his own people and now he thinks God will start his large family through this boy at this time Abram is 86 and has been living under the promise of God for at least a decade his wife Sarai remains barren Ishmael is the only child that has come from Abram and what we heard about him in Genesis 16 did not bode well for his role as successor to Abram, which brings us to Genesis 17 verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him. At point three on the outline, we've got to pay attention to those kind of small details. Whenever we're told Abram's age, we must pause and think, especially when chapter 16 finishes with one statement about his age and chapter 17 begins with another, how many years have passed since Abram's son Ishmael was born? 13 years. Now that event was a terrible error, a moment when Abram and Sarai doubted the promises of God. They took matters into their own hands. No one benefited. So what's happened for 13 years? Abram and Sarai have done the normal life thing. They've eaten breakfast, they've washed clothes, they've moved sheep, they've found pasture, they've paid debts, they've paid bills, they've slept, they've gone to the toilet, they've argued, they've relaxed, they've had picnics, they've gone out. Life has just gone on and on and on for 13 years in all that. 
We're not told what God has said, but his promises remained. That Abram was right with him because Abram had trusted God's words and deeds. That Abram and Sarai had received significant promises from God. Now, 13 years of the promises of God there, we don't know about. God doesn't seem to think that's a problem in his word, does he? In fact, I suspect that God allowed Abram to stew in the consequences of his rebellion against God. I mean, that's reading between the lines, isn't it? In the consequence of his doubting God, as Abram and Sarai raised Ishmael, they saw every day the consequence of what happens when you doubt the goodness of God. Moreover, they lived in those same two realities that I outlined earlier on. The reality of the promise of God that had restored them rightly to God as they took him at his word by faith and the reality of the brokenness of the world they lived in, which they saw every morning at breakfast. They're just like us, living their everyday life wedged between two realities. Now, I suspect they too would have asked questions of God and his promises, the nature and character of God, questions like those ones I outlined at the start, questions like we ask. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him saying, I am God Almighty, live in my presence, be devout. I'll establish my covenant between me and you and I'll multiply you greatly. I'm at point four on the outline. After 13 years, God finally speaks to Abram. I don't know what that looked like. I don't know how Abram reacted immediately, but we do know these things. First, God introduced himself to Abram, didn't he? introduced himself with a name that hadn't been used before in his discussions with Abram, God Almighty. Now, when God introduces himself with a name and a new name at that, pay attention. This name means literally God who is sufficient. Seems to be used in Genesis at moments when those who follow God are in need of reassurance or shoring up. And this is one of those situations. Abram, I'm sufficient to do the very things that I promised to do. Second, after God has revealed his powerful name, he then declares a powerful reassurance. I'll establish my covenant between me and you and I'll multiply you greatly. The wording literally understands that the covenant between God and Abram already exists. It does, doesn't it? Nothing that has happened between Genesis 15 and Genesis 17 has undone the covenant established there in Genesis 15. The covenant that God himself, the Lord, established based on his own grace. He chose Abram for no other reason than it was his desire. Based on Abram's trust, Abram threw himself upon the mercy of God, believing God's promises and acting on it, taking God at his word. The relationship between God and Abram already existed in a covenant, established through grace, received by trust. But God reassures Abram at this point that this covenant, not another one, not a new one, not an alternative one, this covenant was the one that God himself was going to honour and set into eternity. And he does so by focusing on the one seemingly insurmountable obstacle that Abram and Sarai face in their day-to-day lives, a a lack of children. There's a powerful name, there's a powerful reassurance, and third, God gives a powerful command because sandwiched between the name and the reassurance is a powerful command from God. Look there in verse 1, live in my presence, be devout. The covenant's already established. That much is clear. Established by God's grace, received as Abram trusts, in God. That covenant must now be displayed and it's displayed through active, devout obedience. The breadth and extent of this covenant is massive. All of Abram's life must now be lived on public display in active, devout obedience, showing that he takes God at his word and God has been merciful. Now those two verses are very important. After 13 years of silence, God speaks. Powerful name, powerful reassurance, powerful command, spoken so that Abram has confidence in the Lord. Here is the reassurance he needs, but it also reminds Abram, it reminds us of the very significant way, order, if you like, in which God relates to humans. Established in grace, Received by faith, 
displayed in obedience. Let me say that again. Established in grace, received by faith, displayed in obedience. Let me say that again. Established in grace, received by faith, displayed in obedience. In that sense, as Abram lived wedged between those two realities, he could always trust the promises of God because God himself established them. God himself worked them. God himself in his faithfulness underpinned them. God acted first and Abram received and then displayed in active obedience. His trust in God's promises, God's faithfulness, God's initiative, his trust in all of God's work is displayed between these two realities in active and devout obedience. And then God unpacks these opening two verses. I'm at point five on the outline in verses three to 16. The structure is very simple. As for me, describes how God promises to act, verses three to eight. As for you, describes the obedience that will display Abram's trust in God's promises, verses 9 to 16. And again, God gives a powerful reassurance. In fact, in his powerful reassurance of the basic people, land and blessing covenant that is already established by God for Abram, God then elaborates and expands on those promises. The covenant is now put in terms of eternity. This covenantal relationship will be everlasting, never-ending. God commits to his mob for how long? Forever. The people will now encompass kings and nations, many nations. Abram will not just have a large family, but in his family, many nations and kings will find their origin and identity, and the land is reaffirmed as the very same piece of dirt that Abram is now standing. And alongside this powerful reassurance... There is an equally powerful command, the as for you part. Look there in verses 9 to 14. God also said to Abraham, as for you, you and your offspring after you throughout generations are to keep my covenant. This is my covenant which you are to keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every one of your males must be circumcised. You must circumcise the flesh of your foreskin to serve as a sign of the covenant between me and you. Throughout your generations, every male among you at eight days old is to be circumcised. This includes a slave born in your house, one purchased with money from any foreigner. The one who is not your offspring, a slave born in your house, as well as one purchased with money, must be circumcised. My covenant will be in your flesh as an everlasting covenant. If any male is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that man will be cut off from his people. He's broken my covenant. Abram's existence will be marked to show that he trusts in the promise of God. The mark will be a sign of obedience, a display of the trust that Abram has in the sufficiency, the sufficiency of God to do what he's promised. It'll be a physical, permanent, intimate and reminding mark. Now, God did not invent circumcision. Let me, let me be very clear. It was a common practice among the nations in the Middle East at that time. But there are two exclusive differences about this circumcision. Those other nations first always practiced circumcision at the age of adulthood or as a sign of marriage. This circumcision was from birth. The reason second for this circumcision was different. There was a theological explanation, a statement of who God is. He's a covenant-making God who commits faithfully to his people and who this man is in light of that. He is a man who has received this covenant from God in trust and displays it in active obedience. And it involved all of Abram's household, whether they understood it or not, whether they were blood relatives or not. To remind Abram of this powerful reassurance, this powerful command that we've just seen in the as for me, as for you, There's a name change. Abram became Abraham. Sarai became Sarah. The father of many nations would, with his princess, give birth to an heir, and out of them a massive people group would emerge. Or would it? I mean, the promise had been to Abraham that his body would produce an heir. I'm at point six on the outline. This is what God had said time and time again. That's what 
Abraham had trusted. And so in Abraham's mind, the birth of Ishmael was from Abraham's flesh. And so you can understand his faith being here. After all, look at the obstacles that he explains in front of you. I'm a 99-year-old man and a 90-year-old wife. But God's promise is for the child to come from Sarah. Look at verse 15. God said to Abraham, as for your wife Sarai, do not call her Sarai, for Sarah will be her name. I'll bless her indeed. I'll give you a son by her. I will bless her. And she'll produce nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. That, that's how God works. His intervention at a moment where everything looks deathly, dry, desiccated. His undeserved mercy, which we trust, displayed in obedience. Was just a matter of Abram sleeping with someone? That's not how God works. It is his mercy trusted in and obeyed. That is how God works. And at this point, God's response is very important. Look there in verse 19. God said, no, no, Abraham, your wife Sarah will bear you a son. You'll name him Isaac. I'll confirm my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. Trust me, Abraham. I'm at point seven on the outline. Did you see that God didn't blow up at Abraham? There's no stinging rebuke, is there? Instead, there's a general reminder and a reassurance. It's a powerful reassurance, isn't it? There is a name, Isaac, which means laughter. How gracious is God? There's a time frame next year. There's an intent. The covenant will pass from Abraham to Isaac, the child produced from the flesh of Abraham and Sarah. And uh, there are powerful reassurances here. There's powerful grace. Ishmael will be blessed too. God's not stingy in his kindness, and this boy will have great descendants as well. But it's through Isaac, through Isaac, that the promise of God, the covenant, will pass. Now it's worth pausing here and considering the nature of Abraham's trust in God, isn't it? His faith, it's there. It hasn't disappeared. Romans 4 reminded us that against hope, with hope, he believed. Abraham's faith was not missing. It was just developing, growing as he understood the promise of God, as he lived in obedience to God and saw that God himself would never waver. He trusted God to produce the living from the effectively dead. He just could not comprehend how that was possible. Does he sound anything like us? I suspect. Well, he does, does he? And then we see the powerful obedience of Abraham. Point A. Not only did he respond appropriately to the words of God in verse 3, he now displays an explicit obedience to God in verse 23. Then Abraham took his son Ishmael, all the slaves born in his household, purchased with his money, every male among the members of Abraham's household, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskin on that very day, just as God had said to him, that's obedience, isn't it? That's obedience. A covenant promised, established by God, received by faith and responded to in obedience. Here we see the full extent of the covenant community, Abraham's whole household, even Ishmael who not inherit the covenant. Abraham has had 13 years of humdrum life, 13 years of living in that tension between the promise of God and the day-to-day brokenness of the world, 13 years, and God's words now to him after those 13 years, powerful names, powerful reassurances, powerful commands, powerful commitments. God's words at this point are meant to respond to that tension. God is faithful. It does not mean that he always speaks, nor that he removes his mob from everyday life, but God is faithful. He speaks. He keeps his word. He achieves what he promises. God always relates to people the same way. His mercy comes first, bringing humans first, bringing humans back to him. Humans receive God's mercy and faithful promises, trusting that he can do as he says, and then human obedience displays that this mercy has restored them to right relationship with him. The order is crucial. Merciful intervention received by Faith or trust are responded to by obedience. And these two truths, the faithfulness of God, 
the relationship with God established on his initiative, these two truths are the sustenance for Abraham to live in, in active obedience, not to survive, but to live in devout and active obedience in the gaps, in the 13 years of normal life, the tension of the two realities, the promise of God and the brokenness of the world. Are we any different? Are we any different? I'm at point nine on the outline. We know the reality of such gaps, don't we? The periods we're living in that tension produces doubts and questions and queries. That's how we live as God's mob now, isn't it? So how do we apply the experience of this man, Abraham, to us? Well, let me say first what this passage is not about. We're not being commanded to restore circumcision. But I do think we're being reminded of several key truths. First, God is faithful. In the New Testament, the genealogies of Luke and Matthew in the biographies of Jesus draw an explicit and real link between Jesus and Abraham. Remember Matthew 1 verse 1? In this sense, here is the king that God promised back in Genesis 17. And as Jesus saves people from their sins from every nation, here are the many nations talked about in Genesis 17. And between Abraham and Jesus, there are some gaps, not least the 400 years between the Old and New Testament, but lo and behold, what do we see about God? He is faithful. He does as he promised. And he still does. Second, God relates to people now just as he did with Abraham. I think that's the point of that wonderful passage in Romans 4 that we've read a number of times in this sermon series. God relates to us in the same way that he did to Abraham. He is the same God who relates in the same way. His mercy is extended to us first and undeserved. Jesus came when we hated God. Jesus died for humans when we hated God. Jesus rose for humans when we hated God. That is God's mercy. In that sense, against hope but by hope, just like Abraham, God produces a living from the dead. Remember Ephesians 2, 1 to 4? And we receive all the benefits of Jesus' life, death and resurrection. How? By taking God at his word, by trusting him, by having faith that he has done, fulfilled, achieved what he promised in Jesus Christ and that is then displayed in our obedience. Our whole lives are now walked, remember Ephesians, remember Colossians, our whole lives are now walked in front of him in devout and active obedience. Same God, same relating, same grace, same truth, same trust, same devout obedience. Here is the sustenance we need in the gaps. The promises of God rely upon his mercy, his deeds first and foremost. Our part in one sense is easy. Take him at his word. Live like it. In that sense, obedience is our response to everything that God has done in dealing with the seemingly insurmountable obstacles, the heart of which is sin. In that sense, all we need to worry about is responding daily to the clear commands of God. And as we do, as we read those commands, as we spend time in those commands, as we gather with his people, we will grow to know him more deeply, understand the breadths and the depths of his grace more fully, delight in his love more constantly, appreciate his greatness more significantly, proclaim his goodness more consistently, And our lives will be changed, just as we saw in Colossians 3, as the old is put off and the new is gotten used to. But there is a warning here, fourthly, isn't there? Obedience is not how humans are saved and restored to God. Obedience is the the display that God has already done it all. Let me say that again. Obedience is not how humans are saved and restored to God. Obedience is the display that God has already done it all. Here then is the warning of circumcision. 
Not all those obedient in circumcision were saved and restored to God. Look at Ishmael. Obedience is not the way to be saved, but the display of having been saved. Let me say that again. Obedience is not the way to be saved, but the display of having accepted what God has already done before we even wanted him to. The same is true today. Obedience is not how we are saved. It is the display that we have received what God has already done in the life, death and resurrection of the great descendant of Abraham, Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. It is so wonderful that by your word you confront our sin, you intervene in our lives, you declare your promises, you work restoration in the word incarnate in Jesus Christ. This comes to fulfillment and we receive it by taking you at your word, by trusting that you do everything that you promise. Father, work in us the devout walk before you, the active obedience that displays our full dependence on you. Father, as this takes place, as we stumble and grow in understanding you and what it means to depend upon you in every facet of our life, we pray that people in this town will come to know and love you more deeply, be restored to you more fully, and your people grow. In Jesus' name, amen.